Well, we have a new lightweight champion in the UFC, Charles Dubronx Oliveira, knocks out Michael Chandler in the first 20 seconds of the second round. And man, what a fight it was. That first round between them is one of the greatest rounds of mixed martial arts combat I have ever seen in my entire life. From from my, from Charles Oliveira kicking out Chandler's legs two like two times within the first minute to Charles Oliveira having Michael Chandler's back early to Michael Chandler getting out of that. Charles Oliveira throwing up a bunch of submission attempts. Michael Chandler having Charles hurt and almost out at a certain point. Charles coming back and knocking out Michael Chandler instead. Like, let's be honest here. I thought if I, I believe this fight would not make it out the second round. I was telling everybody that. But if you had to ask me, I think the way that either one would have won by what would have won was. Charles Charles Oliveira by submission and Michael Chandler by knockout. I would never have thought that Charles Oliveira would have knocked out Michael Chandler and so quickly and after facing so much adversity in the first round. I mean, it, the second round was only 20 seconds long, but if you look at the, ve the very beginning of the second round, you can see that the odds had actually switched. At the beginning of the fight, Charles was the favorite and Chandler was the underdog. And by the beginning of the second round, Oliveira was the underdog and Chandler was the favorite because of all the shit that had transpired in that first round. So, I mean, that is just one of the best fights I've ever seen in my life. Congrats to Charles Dubronx Oliveira. I mean, what a hell of a fight and what a great fighter and what a way to set up really the landscape of the lightweight division. I mean, you still have Dustin Poirier as a number one contender. Conor McGregor's out there about to go fight Dustin Poirier in what is presumed to be a number one contender's fight. Obviously, the winner of that fight is going to face Charles Oliveira. There's no if ands or buts about it because let's be honest there's nothing that could get you a title shot more than either a beating the number one contender or b fucking knocking out conor mcgregor so i mean that's gonna be a hell of a fight right there i think michael chandler versus justin gage is gonna be a great fight but neil dariush versus rda people are saying is a great fight i would even like justin gagey versus Benil and RDA versus Michael Chandler or some type of mix there to where Michael Chandler and Justin Gagey can both win one more fight before meeting each other because that's a bomb of a fight right there, man. Michael Chandler versus Justin Gagey is a bomb of a fight. Those are two dudes who swing for the fucking fences, you know what I mean? And talking about the lightweight division right now, can we just talk about how Benil Dariush, the number nine ranked male in the lightweight division just totally f just ran over Tony Ferguson he won by unanimous decision almost broke Tony's ankle I mean you know what I mean when I was watching the fight and I see Benil and Tony scrambling and Benil gets the ankle hook and he starts cranking and cranking really hard and you see Tony let go and he's not even fighting them anymore he's just writhing in pain head goes back he screams i'm like man he's gonna snap his fucking leg he's gonna snap his fucking leg and i was so shocked to see tony get out of that and make it to a fucking decision and honestly in the first round i had tony winning because yeah he was on the ground but for the most part he was throwing a submission attempt after submission attempt and i thought he would eventually get one and tighten it enough to submit benil but props to benil you know what i mean he's a hell of a fighter a great grappler <laughs> almost tapped out a let excuse me almost tapped out a legend like tony ferguson i mean at one point tony ferguson was the one of the greatest fighters on planet earth okay it sucks as a fan of tony el kukui ferguson he was he was my he was the first fighter that got me into mixed martial arts period not just the ufc mixed martial arts period so to see the skid that he's been on now it does sadden me but you cannot take away anything from the people who have beaten him. Charles Oliveira, I mean the current lightweight champion. Justin Gagey, last fight was for the title against Khabib. 
and Benil Darius, okay? You know what I mean? Like, you can't knock the guy for losing within the top 10. What's next for Tony Ferguson? Well, let's see this. He was number five. He lost number nine. Dan Hooker would be a good one. I think Dan Hooker is maybe number seven or number eight now. Uh, he's already fought RDA. Maybe a rematch with RDA might be in the books. But if you ask me, RDA and Islam Makachev have unfinished business. Uh, speaking of Islam Makachev, Benil Dariush mentioned in the post-fight press conference that th that is not a name that he is open to fighting. Seeing After seeing the landscape uh, of Lightweight in a couple of months... Islam Makachev is currently booked with somebody, some unranked guy that he's going to steamroll right through. I'm sorry, no offense to the man he's fighting, but that's just what I think. You're unranked, and Islam Makachev is clearly a formidable opponent for anyone within the top five rankings of the UFC's lightweight division. So I don't think that an unranked guy is going to have too good of a shot against him. But I mean, hey, a fight's a fight, and anything could happen. He has a loss. He's, he's been beaten before. It could happen. But... Islam Makachev versus Benil Dariush would be a good one. Tony Ferguson versus Dan Hooker would be a good one. I even like RDA versus Justin Gaethje to give Michael Chandler some time because he did just get knocked out. Um, uh, I would the number one most important fight we need to see in the lightweight division is the winner of Poirier McGregor versus Oliveira, and that's going to be a really important fight. For the lightweight division in general because well let's go through both scenarios where do we go if dustin beats connor again well that's like what is it three four uh well except for the cowboy fight but what is it that's two straight now four and four and uh, uh f four losses in his last five competitions if mcgregor loses the next fight i mean does he retire after that He's the sixth ranked lightweight in the world right now. And I mean, Dustin Poirier is a super formidable opponent. He's obviously the number one contender for a reason. But if he's losing two in a row like that and Conor McGregor is this huge superstar where you can't put him as anything other than a main event for a car, for a card. You can't put him as a main event for a fight night. He's too big. And a sold out arena nonetheless. You can't put him in any one of these little Abu Dhabi places where there's no fans. I mean, does he retire after that? Does he fight his way back through the rankings on fight nights and on co-main events for cards and shit like that? Because think about it. Conor McGregor loses this fight. Okay, he's number six ranked in the world. Um, let's say you give him a number... Let's say after this you give him Benil Dariush. You're really going to make Benil Dariush versus Conor McGregor the, co the, the main event for UFC 260 whatever? I mean, you could, but you'd just be doing that because he's such a big star not because he's really at the top you would have people you would have a higher ranked match under them you know what i mean like you could have number one and versus number two fighting in any other division under them and i don't think that'd be right because they mcgregor wouldn't be at the top per se if dustin loses it's not as big as of a, a big of a it's not as big of a deal, I think, because he's number one right now. Let's say he loses to Conor McGregor. He goes to number two. He still has 13 more people he's above and can fight and to choose to show he's w ready for a, the title shot after Conor. You know what I mean? Uh, man, lightweight's going to be some fucking fun in this next year. Andre Muniz breaking Jacare Souza's arm as someone with a broken arm I don't know if y'all can see that I've got a broken arm I've had a broken arm as someone with a broken arm that is super horrifying to see it happen in the ring to somebody it obviously did happen to me in the ring it happened to me as a child but to see it happen to Jacare Souza and I believe they the broadcast team said it's even happened to him before he's broken in his arm before in a com in a combat competition but to see his arm be broken like that after the scramble that him and muniz got into where muniz ends up with his whole body basically on jacare's arm to see jacare's arm just break like that and to hear it and to see it all that and it was super horrible and to see more uh, videos this morning of jacare in the hospital and shit it really upsets me because he's 41 and he's one of the greatest He's had one of the great, some of the greatest fights of all time, him versus Weidman. I mean, some of the greatest fights of all time. And he's been at the top for a while and he's a legend. He's a vet, multiple time championship in so many different ways. 
41 years old. So, you know, I mean, how can you really come back to competing at a high level like that? You know, like, after with a broken arm, but... My prayers go out to Jacare, Ronaldo, Ronaldo Jacare Souza. I hope that everything is okay, and I hope that he can do whatever he wants to do. Uh, Edson Barboza versus Shane Burgos. That was one of the craziest knockouts we've seen from Edson Barboza, and that's coming from Edson Bar. That, that's that's from Edson Barboza, the king of crazy knockouts, the first wheel kick ever, a highlight reel on highlight reel of cr- amazing kicks to. To hit Shane Burgos with an overhand right in the temple and to have Shane Burgos fall five seconds after the punch land, to have a delayed, to have Shane experience a delayed reaction KO to the punch was just something I've never seen before. I've never, I mean, even Joe Rogan said it and he's been fucking commentating in the sport for how many fucking decades? And if he hasn't seen it, I definitely fucking haven't seen it. I know what, I don't think that's ever happened where a fight like that has ended like that overhand right boom five seconds and the person who ate that overhand right just falls back and collapses i mean edson barbozo was definitely putting up a great fucking fight it's great to see edson the vet the dude who's been through so fucking much and so fucking long for so fucking long rise up in the ranks of a new division and see him have like new hope for a fucking title shot i mean he just crack the top 10 you know what i mean what's next for him if you ask me i say either max cater or yair obviously yair and zabi have unfinished business and as a beat fan i am and a yair fan i am that needs to be a fight night fight that has to happen or you know even one of the that could be on one of the main events of these huge cards they're having these super cards that i love that they've been having where there's fucking three title fights and fucking couple of other amazing fights with huge names but yeah man Calvin Cater versus Edson Barboza would be a great fucking fight. Great fucking fight. Obviously, you know, I don't know if you want to give that Calvin Cater saying he's just, seeing as he's just come off a loss to Max Holloway, you probably want to give him someone who could probably beat the shit out of a little easier. Um, But still, I mean, I'm excited to see Edson Barboza back in the fucking mix at a whole new division. It's fresh. It's cool. It's lit. You know what I mean? Um... You know what? UFC 262 was a great fucking uh, card. Uh, the crowning of a new lightweight king, Charles Oliveira. And by the way, can we just can I just say the 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 ten minute sequence? I think it's on like UFC BT Sport on YouTube. The ten minute sequence following the moment Charles Oliveira knocks out Michael Chandler is just so heartwarming. I almost I I, I teared up. I mean, seeing Charles Oliveira. You know, run, jump over the cage, go say what's up to the broadcast team, yell in their microphones, go say what's up to Dana, sit next to him, talk, speak to him with no translator, just speak to Dana and heart to heart. I mean, no, neither of them understand each other, but they, he was just speaking to him to see him run around the crowd, dance, to see him get in the ring and he, he kiss the bell, hold the bell, like realize he really finally won it after a decade of being in the octagon, after a decade of growing up in the octagon, in the UFC octagon, 11 years, 28 prof- UFC fights, okay, ups and downs from being, I think it was like four, three and five before moving to lightweight to becoming like nine and one, and not having and going on an eight finish streak. Well, besides Tony Ferguson, but a damn listen. After seeing Tony Ferguson not tap to these last two submissions, I am pretty comfortable in saying that he cannot be submitted. And obviously, with the fucking luck I have, he's gonna get submitted in his next fight. I hope not. I hope he fucking wins his next twenty thousand fights. But I don't think you can submit Tony Ferguson, man. I don't think it can happen. Did you see the way Charles Oliveira tucked that shit under it, tucked his arm under his fucking... Did you see that fucking arm bar? Did you see that fucking heel hook? There's no way you're tapping Tony Ferguson out. Either way, that was a great fucking card. I fucking love you guys. Until next time, stay safe, stay positive. Peace out. <laughs>